The Collaborating Conversation podcast is for avid book readers, book lovers, and authors. Listen to this podcast as we talk more about the art of writing, stories behind books, and the hands that created them. So stay tuned and enjoy our show. Welcome to the Collaborating Conversations podcast. Today's episode is part one of the Founder Series Deep Dive by author Emmanuel M. Ariaga. Hello, and I think we're live. All right. Yeah, so it sounds like you have some good news. What happened for the, uh, was it this week or last week? Uh, it was end of last week. All right. So end of, so last, end of week. last week, um, my audio book dropped. Woo-hoo. Now this is the rever- redo version of the first book, correct? Or is it the second ver- second book? It's the first book. The redo of the first book. Yeah, the second edition. Okay. <clears throat> so you did make some changes? Yeah, I mean, it's mainly um, like, uh, if anything, was the removal of some content that didn't necessarily add fully to the story. So it's just a cleaner, no, no significant changes. Like the, the, the core of the story is the same. No significant events have been removed. It's more just there were some areas where the prose could have been a little tighter. Prose? What do you mean by prose? I'm not familiar with that term. Just the writing, the, the, um, when, the, when, when people say the pro, like the prose, is, it's just like how, you know, how something is explained or written to so the, um, the flow typically. Okay. So like the flow is cleaned up a little bit in some areas, you know, usually it's just like a few wording choice changes or removal of some content, you know, with an eye towards increasing clarity or, you know, removing things that don't add to the story. And so for, for my set, for mine, it was more, it was mainly around removing things that didn't add to the story and just, you know, having another, um, a, a second editor go through and uh, just look at it from a fresh set of eyes. Mm. But uh, are we giving mainly, a spoiler warning? Or are we going to try to stay spoiler free tonight? I mean, the book's been out for a while, so it's like, <laughs> well, hey, not everyone listening to our podcast is going to read the book. So I think this is the official spoiler warning. If you have not read, the yeah. War is this the and what's the what's the first book subtitle or? Uh, it's just Founder. Okay. All right, that was another thing. I removed the. Um, the Rift War caption. So it's just, it's not Founder of the Rift War, it's just Founder. Uh, Founder, book one of the Founder series. And so it was just kind of, you know, going with a cleaner title. I remember back when I first launched the Rift War, there was, um, there's actually another series called the Rift War. Oh, what? Uh, uh, it's the Rift War saga. Uh, and so there's a lot of confusion mm. to whether it was related to that. Uh, or if it was a knockoff of that, and it was, you know, the Rift War Saga is like this fantasy series that has nothing to do with sci-fi or, <laughs> you know, anything related to my book, you know, not even comparable, right? Uh, and so, yeah, part of it was getting rid of that confusion, you know, the things that you have, you know, you don't have access to as a self-published author, like like a brand strategist um, type of stuff that you kind of learn after the fact. For example, so that, or what do you mean by that? No, just like conflicting titles or brand confusion. Hmm. Normally, you'd have a brand strategist who would look out at the market and come up with the branding. You're, you know, you're essentially self-published, right? Yeah, uh, which means I just have to pay for everything myself. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I think it was um, going with that, going with a cleaner title. Um, you know, the Rift War is still referenced in the second novel, but it's more so it's more so an event, um, you know, um, because the, the the war in the first novel is still referred to as the Rift War mm. um, because, you know, okay. you so know these just, to clarify, next, huh? first, just to clarify, the first book and second book are the second book was released, but it hasn't had the second audio book. So the first book has audio and EPUB or Kindle, and the second book is just Kindle currently, correct? Yeah, uh, it's Kindle and print. Okay. So Kindle and print for the first and the second, and then there's also an audiobook for the first. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, you know, I was just kind of looking at the book with a fresh set of eyes, both for the editor and for myself, because I actually went through and did a pass through the book, and, you know, 
Which one did you first release it? 2015. Okay. So it was a long time ago. Oh, you released it before we moved out. So before I met you then. Yeah, I had been published for a while before um before then. And uh yeah, the audiobook. I think the audiobook had come out shortly after I moved to the Bay Area. Yeah, I think that's right. The audiobook. No, the audiobook was released before I moved out here because it launched in July of 2016. But yeah, so it was um yeah, just a, a second edition. It's something that's actually, you know, a lot of a lot of books do second editions, third editions. A lot of times they just don't announce them. Mm, they just revisit or they don't the change. You know, a lot of times they'll change the cover. So like if you ever go out on Amazon and you look at a book and that book has been around for a while and it has like four or five different covers that, you know, all the old covers are no longer available. Mm. It's usually an indication that they have um, done another edition. Hmm. That's good to know. A little industry secret there. Yeah. And a lot of times authors will go and they'll, they'll do content uh, continuity changes. Okay. Um, Cause a lot of times, you know, as you progress a series, especially a series that's been along for a long time, you, you know, you'll, you'll go down a path where you, you know, you couldn't mess with continuity, you know, and so a lot of times when authors do this because it, you know, it makes sense for the series or it makes sense for, you know, the, um, these different things, it ends up being, um, it ends up being, um, needed for them to go back and update the initial draft just to either add, you know, language or remove language for whatever the continuity changes. Mm -hmm. For example, if you make a character like change a belief system later on or something like kind of signal that he's questioning that earlier in the book or something. Sometimes it's not, it's not that as much as it is, you know, like, Oh, these, these characters are related, you know? And it's just like, you know, you, you never, you know, earlier in the book, you're just like, Oh, they came from two different families, you know? Okay. <laughs> but then later on, you're just like, Oh, they're actually brother and sister. And then you're just like, Oh, that seems like I a big change. <laughs> yeah. A lot, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of times, you know, something just, I didn't, I didn't really have, um, there was one, there was one, actually there was one continuity change and it had to do with, uh, Amaria in the, uh, in the first book and in the second book, because they, she has a story arc in the second book. And, you know, in the, in this, in the second book, like there was this really big, important scene between them. And it made a lot more sense if they, if they had a lot more history than I originally mentioned that they had, you know, so it went from being, you know, them having a fling to them actually having been married. Um, uh, and so, you know, I was able to explore that further with them, you know, as a divorced couple, uh, in the second book and, you know, having a bitter relationship versus, you know, just a regret that Lenret had in the first book. Mm. And so that actually, you know, was a pivotal part of the narrative that ended up affecting Nevin in the second book. That's a simple continuity change because it's like, it literally like reworked like one sentence. But yeah, I wouldn't have thinking think about one sentence makes that much of a difference. But dang. Yeah, I think that was the only major thing. But yeah, it was. Um, yeah, now I'm doing an audio book tour with a blog tour it's coming up april 15th uh where i'm working with this um this one site where they they coordinate blog tours across the blog tour that's something i'm not familiar with yeah i did something similar for my the Risa pride of ashina so a blog tour is when you basically um it's usually to support the release of a new novel or an audiobook and you you coordinate the release with a number of book bloggers or audio book bloggers in this case, and they um, prep a lot of content ahead of time. So like you do author interviews, mm. you know, share details about the creative process, about the, about the book, you know, and so that I'm in, I'm in the process of putting together a lot of content for the scheduler. And, um, you know, she's basically provides each um, blog with a set of um, materials that they then, you know, go and, prepare to support the launch and you know it drives traffic to their site and you know it's a way to get uh people to review the book and also to get people to um so similar like to a tech review right like so like mkbhd like he gets phones and stuff ahead of time so he can kind of get his reviews up and running kind of thing yeah it's a similar a similar process 
except those are more for like tech products versus yeah. like a book. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's a different genre of marketing kind of, right? Like it's, I'm assuming there's, are there a lot of book reviewers? I know I've thought about. Yeah. Them. I mean, there's, there's a ton of them. And so usually the, the, the tour guides end up having a set of uh, blogs that they primarily work with, you know, they have relationships with. I'm assuming uh, it's kind of one of those, here's the, here's a copy of the book. Here's a review. You know, let me know what you think type of thing, feedback and review. Yeah. Although they don't necessarily have to do that a For lot sure. of times. They might just be, um, they might just want to host the book and provide like an author interview or something like that. And so it's a way to just, you know, reach people who you might not have considered uh, part of your, you know, sales demographic or uh, people you didn't have a, a reach into before that, you know, you can get with, um, with doing, doing something like a blog tour. So mm-hmm. yeah, I learned about them um, when I hired a book marketer for my last for the release of pride of ashna because i actually had someone draw up a um book marketing strategy for me and when they did that you know it was essentially a way to um but the blog tours was a part of that did you uh so i guess so the first book is just uh foundra and or and the second book is foundra pride of ashna is that correct uh, it's just Pride of Ashton for the second one. Okay. So Foundra is, has, is the series tagline now. Okay. So the book, the first book is Foundra and the series name is the Foundra series. Okay. And so every book that's a relaunched after, you know, we'll just have, um, the, the series tagline. So it'll say like, um, you know, the, the title of the book and then underneath of that title, it says founder series. Oh, uh, okay. And then so the book a, number it is. So that's a complete switch. Cause obviously I got, um, full disclosure here. Emmanuel, uh, did give me a copy of the book and I was, uh, I needed to do a review for that. However, okay. I did enjoy the book. It was a ton of fun. So I'm still thinking just because I haven't kept up with all the changes founder of the rift war. Um, that's how I remember. It. And I liked it because at least after reading the book, I thought that was a really cool, like, the founder of Rift War series was getting like uh, from what I've read and just the way, you know, where you see, I can see the world building and what direction you're going. Um, I can see that cool, but apparently that had to change, especially due to copyright or other titles and confusion that could happen. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't so much worried about copyright as it was just, um, um, it was just, uh, creating a different, unique brand. I was going to say, did you do any uh, SOE search and kind of figure out what kind of names and what things worked best? Or was that part of the figuring out the brand? Well, you know, you're you're limited to some extent because it's already a launched book. So you can't do a a drastic brand change. Mm. But it was it was more effective to remove the the Rift War branding, Mm. even though the book, the the war is still referred to as the Rift War in the book or in subsequent books. But it was it was it was important to remove that branding uh, for the first book uh, in order to make it more unique and, and have it stand on its own better. Mm. So, yeah. And that was due to market research, just determining that that would be the best option. Yeah, it was just it was based off of research and, um, you know, understanding of how things were received in our review community and stuff like that. Because whenever you know I would market it, people would go like, you know what is this a knockoff the Rift War saga? And it's just like, no, I didn't even know the Rift War saga existed. <laughs> did that, did that kind of provide a lot of negative feedback? Cause people are like, why would you cop like kind of like if you're copying something that kind of it's looked down upon? Yeah. It's more so, you know, you know, people always assume. So it's, um, it's important to assume good intent. That was a way to kind of eliminate those, um, those critiques. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And I've, and one of the things I've done is, I redid my website. Ooh. I changed my, and this was, this was actually due to feedback from my, um, so just like, just to talk to this side, I guess. So at the big, you know, at the, at the main landing page, you know, there's this video running in the background for the top banner. Uh, so there's no audio. So it's just, it's like, um, it's an embed, uh, with a buy, you know, buy on Amazon button superimposed in the, in the video. Um, so I, you know, I borrowed this concept from a lot of, uh, award-winning authors who, you know, have catchy graphics at the top. And I also focused the the front page around selling. So like before my front page used to just be around like introducing people to content 
but now it's like, you know, you get to the landing page and it's just like, here's the new thing, you know, with an ability to buy, here's all the books that I've published. Here's new merch that's for sale. And then I get into content. So like, here's the blog posts, short stories, and then signed up for the newsletter. And so before it was, it was mainly like, here's a bunch of blogs. Here's the new book that released. And then, you know, here's short stories and then the new newsletter and then social media stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, at the time, like it, it sounded like a good idea, but when I went and looked at other competitors' websites, like they very much focused on selling right out right out the gate and using their website as a um, mm-hmm. as a as a as a drop off point for pushing people to their to their to buy their to buy their stuff. Uh, and so, you know, just kind of rechange this. You know, I still have a link to the merch store at the top. Um, so yeah, so for each book, I did a landing page. <laughs> Which is something that my um, I played around with this concept before, but my uh, my social media team, you know, I, I had a, a, a conversation with them this year around like really focusing on selling, and actually gave me feedback and said like, hey, we, you know, it's better if we if we're able to point marketing to a landing page on your website versus directly on Amazon because you know we're able to better track metrics and things like that, um, <clears throat> and conversions, and so. So, you know, I took the feedback to heart and went back, you know, I I originally had some pages, but I actually went and and created like a, you know, holistic experience for each one. So every book I have has a book trailer, you know, and then have the cover of the book along with the the marketing text description for... um, Is that marketing description the same as what would be on the back? Yeah. Yeah. And this is also the same that's on Amazon. Um, And then... um, any recognition that it's received. So founder was the National Indie Excellence Award finalist, science fiction, and then uh, reader's favorite book award finalist for sci-fi romance, Ooh. which I'm surprised, actually. Um, there were so there's sexy scenes in the book, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, you know, I definitely viewed it as a... Um, you know, a core part of the narrative is being this romance novel between Nevin and, and Zun and, you know, Zun, you know, primarily focusing on Zun from the perspective of, you know, her dealing with this traumatic loss at the beginning of the book, mm-hmm. and going through the healing process throughout the book, you know, kind of rediscovering herself and then, you know, rediscovering new love with, with Nevin. Um, and then this, this narrative with Nevin, you know, just kind of, um, struggling with, um, you know, being in a relationship, you know, and being in a serious relationship for the first time. Uh, and so it was a, you know, there was a lot of undertones of, of, of a romantic, uh, you know, story there, but to have it actually formally recognized, you know, you know, as almost being an award winner, being a finalist, um, you know, for sci-fi romance, I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> Looking for an exciting space adventure book, a romantic young adult story, and a fantastic sci-fi read? Get The Fondra by award-winning author Emmanuel M. Ariaga today and prepare to feed your imagination with never-ending thrill ride. I didn't even know that was a genre. I know I'm a huge fan of sci-fi, space opera, um... You know, hardcore science fiction. My favorite books are the Bobbleverse and a few other stuff. But yeah, I never even thought of the romantic side of adding that to a uh, science fiction book to be to be fun, like to be fun, or even have its own reward. You know, like uh, re- you know, like have a sec- um, well, wow, words are hard to have a section of um, <clears throat> to be voted on and win something. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, it's typically a genre that a lot of publishers actually stay away from. Funny enough. Because it's um, it kind of touches on two genres that uh, it's it's one of the hardest genres to sell in apparently. Uh, the romance novel or the science fiction novel? Uh, sci-fi romance. Oh, hmm. yeah, it's one of the it's one of the hardest genres to sell. Um, I can see that because a lot of nerds are probably. <laughs> I love my weaves and I love my nerds, but uh, we're not always the best when it comes to romantic uh, t- entanglings. Um. Yeah, and, and so a lot of literary agents, if you want to go that route, typically avoid sci-fi romances like The Plague. 
Um, we should probably stop using that terminology because clearly people do not avoid the plague like they should. Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. Controversial topic. Controversial topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the plague's here. Oh, geez. Apparently there's another variant coming down the pipeline. Yeah, we were talking about that at work. <laughs> you know, our, our, you know, the consensus was like, this might be bad, but no one cares anymore. <laughs> People so just I, want to I, return to office and return turn to work, and yeah. you know, well, did you hear yeah, there's a variant, but you know, <laughs> there's no changes to any plans. <laughs> yeah. Well, New York's new mayor is like, we got to get everybody back to work. You lazy people, like uh, remote work is here to stay. People, remote work was on an uptick, I think, before COVID, and COVID just pushed it over the edge. I don't think a lot of cities realized how close, right? Yeah, and so yeah, so sci-fi romance. Typically, a genre people stay away from. Funny of a genre that's very popular is sci-fi erotica, which is a completely different type of book. Well, I mean, is erotica? Well, okay, so that thing is uh, your book kind of has. Would it be considered some of that erotica, or is that not no. to that level? Because it did have some like description. Uh, at least, if I remember correctly, it did have some very descriptive scenes. Yeah, but that's that's not a so erotica book is written. With the primary objective being characters hooking up. Okay. And so the story is based around hookups. The most of the action in the book is hookups, usually with many different people or many different characters. Um, it is smut, pure and simple. Right. Um, but. Um, so that's so. Uh, this might be. Might be considered a little controversial, but I've always, I, I was always curious as, you know, f- since your faith is super important, like, how did you decide to add um, descriptive, intimate scenes in a book, right? Like, how how did that, did faith have an impact on the decision, or was that just something like, oh, you're okay with that? Like, oh, I've been very curious, because I know, depending on where you are on the, on the faith side or the conservative, like, super conservative side would be like, you should never, ever do this, and then more on the other side would be like, it doesn't matter. But I was just always curious, because I think it's an interesting line or an interesting, I didn't have a personal problem. Like, personally, I had no problem with it. I thought it worked with the character development. It worked with the story. It was interesting. Um, but I'm curious, like, how did that decision come to add that, right? Or to make it an adult book? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I wanted to present a novel from a realistic standpoint, right? Adults are intimate? What? Yeah. Are and so I think um, I wanted to show reality, you know, as best as you can in a sci-fi novel. But I also want to share the positive and negative outcomes of that reality, right? And so I think if one of the things you'll notice, especially with the characters that, you know, some of the characters that are intimate is that a lot of their relationships are shaky, right? And they have challenges, you know, especially if they're not, if they're not, you know, you know, if their relationship started that way, right? Uh, and so, you know, I think I, I tried to do, I tried to show a, a spread of relationships in a book ones where you have people who their relationships were built on different things. Mm-hmm. And um, for a lot of those characters, you know, for like, if there was a cup, you know, a good example is like Arnia and Marcus, right. <clears throat> you know, so Marcus, you know, the, the big arc light, um, you know, genetically engineered super soldier. Right. So he's been married to Arnia for decades. Right. And, um, and their relationship, you know, they have a family and they, you know, uh, you know, military relationship, you know, uh, built on, you know, commitment and, and being faithful all the way, you know, and all other stuff, you know, so they're, you know, when they're together, you know, you see a lot of love in their actions, but I don't have any intimate scenes between them because, you know, I wanted to reflect that mm-hmm. in those relationships. It's not, you know, intimacy means more than just sex. Right. And so, and so, you know, there are no there are no intimate scenes between Arnie and Marcus intentionally from the from that perspective. But they do have scenes where they are, you know, there's other forms of intimacy, right? Like, you know, flirting with each other and, you know, communication you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, and all other stuff. And that was intentional, right? As opposed to like Tashner and Jensi, right? Where it's just like, you know, anytime they're together, you know, it's usually sex, right? But that's like the basis of their relationship. And so they don't really have much else. And it really shows, you know, it feels kind of hollow. And, uh, you know, and that and that's intentional, right? And there's a story arc that comes 
you know, in future novels, right, where it starts to play out in the sequel, you know, and comes to a, a culmination in the third book that I'm working on right now, right? And so it's very intentional in, in how I treat the different relationships. Like Zona and Nevin, you know, never have sex in the first book, you know, in, 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 a, in, the, in, the, in the normal sense, right? They definitely skirt the line many times, but they never do. And you see their, their relationship, you know, develop in other ways. And, you know, they're, and they, they learn to be intimate in other ways, right? And so, you know, and so I wanted to, I, I wanted to explore many different aspects of relationships and, and, and be realistic about it and, you know, put my worldview in there too, you know, in terms of how I view, you know, healthy relationships and, and what they're based off of. Right. Um, that and so that's why question. I, my you know, question was going to be how, um, did you, yeah, did your faith like influence how you want to like, cause uh, as someone of faith and someone of, you know, kind of wanting to like, you know, statistically waiting towards marriage is not standard in our culture, but that is more in the faith group. Did that affect like that? You kind of want to use your platform to discuss the pros and cons or like have just, do you want to open a discussion with people or just have people think about it internally? Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm more so not trying to force my worldview on anyone from that perspective, but I definitely show Nevin who struggles with trying to stay true because that's his personal worldview, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout the entire book. And he fights very hard to, you know, maintain that worldview in the real world. Mm. Right. And, and, it, and it's not easy. Right. You know, a lot of people, especially people who grow up with that worldview, when they hit the real world. Right. Like a lot of a lot of times they struggle and break, you know, out of that worldview or, you know, uh, do things they regret because they, you know, it's tough. Right. And so I wanted to represent that with Nevin, where, you know, he, he has this worldview, you know, it was instilled by his parents and, you know, uh, and then he basically gets into this relationship where he's trying really hard to, to not have sex before marriage. And, you know, <laughs> you know, Zun, Zun at one point kind of laughs at him because she doesn't believe him. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, and so it's, you know, cause she definitely does not have the same worldview. Right. Uh, and so that was, before divorced or her husband died. I forget. I forget. It's been a while since I read the book. So I apologize. I'm forgetting some of the details. Yeah. Her previous husband died. That's revealed to be get, near the beginning of the book. She was in a relationship with, uh, with Yvonne, Yvonne who died, you know, in the, in the opening scene of the book, uh, when they're fighting this, um, the super villain, uh, I guess is the best way to describe him. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, um, you know, it's a traumatic moment for her because it was the first time that she had found, you know, like love in her life, right? Like she had settled down with Yvonne, um, you know, after a long life of avoiding committed relationships, right. but not necessarily avoiding sex, just avoiding committed relationships. Right, because uh, her character, um, her race, I think, lives super long, right? Yeah, so she's half Husian, half human. And so Husian lives for about a thousand years. A human lives for about 200 years in my story, in my universe. Um, and, uh, you know, so half Husians, half humans live for about five, 500 or so years. Um, and so she, um, you know, she's, she's up there. She's in her, her late 300s. You know, so she'd be the equivalent of like, you know, someone in early, you know, the mid to late 40s mm -hmm. um, in today's, you know, age. Uh, and so, you know, she spends most of her life with flings and, you know, uncommitted relationships. And then she, you know, actually settles down for the first time with Yvonne because she wants to actually, you know, have a family. And, you know, she's kind of post career, you know, she's, you know, this is revealed more in the second novel, but, you know, she had been hyper career focused for, for, you know, for, for most of her life. And she had been an incredibly successful, you know, tech genius. Right. Um, she was you know, the military thing, right? Huh? She was working on the military base and creating the, I forget what it was. She, she worked for um, the Mensai, which is uh, not, not necessarily related to the military. It's, it's the, the, like a government run scientific research lab. Um, but they, you know, they pay their people basically the top of market. Right. And so she, you know, she, uh, you know, she, she had been a successful tech entrepreneur before she joined the men's high, right? And so she's literally a multi billionaire. You know, it's, that's revealed in the second in the second I was novel. Just about to ask. I don't remember that being revealed in the first novel and Nevin doesn't know. No. It, right? No, it's it's an it's an aspect that I explore more in the second novel. So she she's a multi billionaire <laughs> and she has um you know 
immense wealth uh, and, you know, kind of goes along with her genius, right? She's created a lot of interesting technologies and, you know, that, it, that it's revealed more about her. And that's actually a narrative in the second book where Nevin kind of, you know, realizes how much he doesn't know about her when she starts to reveal this aspect, aspect of her life, like letting him in more. And he, he, you know, suddenly realizes that, you know, he's dating a multi-billionaire uh, and, and, you know, he's kind of afraid because it's, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to be, you know, it, it has O level stressor, especially with, with, with the introduction of his mom or her mom, you know, who, you know, who thinks he's just out to get her money. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, it's this interesting dynamic play out. Do you intend to also go in the direction um, like money doesn't buy happiness type of thing that it's just a tool? You know, it's interesting because I think from Zun's standpoint, she doesn't care about the money. She's more in it for the adventure, right? Like that's why she joins the Founders Elite with Len Rett, right? Because she, you know, she could live the rest of her life in luxury, but she she doesn't value those things, right? You know, wealth wealth has come to her because she's incredibly smart and entrepreneurial. You know, she uses that wealth for her mom, right? Like for you know, for her family and friends back on Thigh, you know, which is the home world. I'm assuming that's in the second book because I don't remember any of that in the first book. Yeah, this is all in the second book. Um, it's hinted at in the first book. So mm-hmm. when they talk about um, like um, the first assistant um, for Echnix, mm-hmm. uh, when they introduce the first assistant for Echnix, um, Atreus, Echnix makes a comment about, you know, lining his pocket with Larids, which Larids is the currency in the mm-hmm. Foundry universe. And so, you know, he makes this comment about, you know, freely lining his pocket with Larids, you know, because the chief assistant is um, highly paid, you know. And so just in that role alone, you know, you become a, you know, a multimillionaire, you know, from being in that role for just a few years. Right. Uh, and Zoom was in that role for 50 years, you know. So, you know, from that alone, there's a lot of wealth that she amassed just being there. But she was already independently wealthy before she joined the Mensai. Right. And so. Um, you know, it just kind of plays into that, but, but yeah, so it was, it was more so just, um, um, you know, showing the different relationship dynamics, different social classes. Cause you know, one of the narratives throughout the first book and the second book is just the, you know, income inequality and the challenges with, um, you know, they're still being poor people. And this is, and this is a huge narrative in the second book with the pirates and the outer rim where, you know, there's just this, you know, this whole section of space where you know extreme poverty is a thing right and it leads to people doing horrible things to survive you know why you have multi-billionaires you know running around you know saving the universe right um and so it, it kind of it kind of exposes that you know some of the challenges that exist in society you know with a sci-fi flair right um, yeah, similar to like the belters in the expanse series right like mistreated misused yeah i think it's different um Primarily because in the outer rim, like there's no value that they provide to mm. um, the the other galaxies or the other uh, you know galactic empires, so they're ignored completely. Um, Which means they can't and, trade routes; they can't necessarily produce anything. No, and they and they and they're basically run by pirate uh, these large pirate empires, mm. you know, where you have these pirate bands that are very powerful that have created their own version of society built on exploitation, slavery, um, and theft. Right. And they maintain order through, you know, that, that structure. Right. And so it's a terrible environment to live in. And, um, you know, there's entire, there's an entire section of space which exists there. And it actually leads to, the main character of Pride of Ashna, Sarah Elex, is this character here. You know, it, it's her story, right? You know, she she kind of, you know, she's a Das Ven, you know, who is this species in the um, in the Foundry universe that are these uh, peace peace loving species that's focused on, you know, building relationships and maintaining peace throughout the galaxy, right? So she comes from this this background, except you know. She, you know, her parents go to the outer rim to help people in the outer rim and they end up, you know, becoming victims to pirates, you know, and she ends up losing half her family. Um, and, uh, 
you know, it plays out that, you know, she, she doesn't grow up in Dawson society. She grows up in the outer rim society and that influences her, who she is as a person. And she becomes a very vengeful um, warrior, you know, which is counterculture to who the Dawson are. Right. And so it's an interesting dynamic. Cause you know, I talk about the Dawson a lot in the first book I kind of introduced them as this majestic peace loving wise species of technologically advanced um, um, people, you know, who have no gender. Um, but are viewed as female, um, but they're, they're, they're non-binary and, um, you know, they end up, uh, you know, and in the second book actually, you know, play with the concept of them being, you know, one, one of, one of the Dasven growing up and it's just, you know, being influenced by her society, you know, being influenced by a completely different society that instills in her a set of values that are, you know, contrary to, you know, the vast majority of her populace and actually, you know, labels her as an outcast, you know, actually plays out, you know, early on in the second book where, you know, she's viewed as, she's viewed as an outcast or as someone who, you know, who didn't grow up in Dasven society, who could actually be a risk to, you know, Dasven principles or, um, uh, Lifestyle. they call they call them news n- noiser, um, which is a term they specifically have for Dasvin outsiders, Dasvin who are not raised in Dasvin society, who haven't been socialized into Dasvin culture, principles, and values. And so they, they view those people as, as different from, from the rest of Dasvin because they, they, they see them as corrupted, as, um, as different. And because they're different, you know, they can't ever truly be part of Dasvin society because they would bring conflict and, uh, in harmony. Uh, you know, and the Dasvin society is built around harmony. Um, and so, you know, it plays with that concept, you know, uh, just with, with Dasvin society and, and, and things like that. And so, you know, that, that narrative of, of inequality and, um, being influenced by our environment, you know, is a core narrative theme throughout the second book. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this one, check out part two of today's episode on Spotify, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast for more books and inspiring stories of today's authors. Mm-hmm.